I've been practicing meditation for almost 50 years, and I'm giving it a try also. Moment by moment. Never boring. Always full of possibility. So this, this guided meditation that we just went through together is really my talk already given. And maybe I'll just reframe it. And, and then you can relax and um, see, see if you can find the similarities. There's a, there's a quote that I really love from uh, Suzuki Roshi, who wrote Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. I don't know, probably some of you have heard of this book, but it was one of the first books to inspire me to take up Zen and meditation. And in this book, he said something that's a little bit startling when you first hear it, and then it gradually makes sense. I think he's trying deliberately to be a little provocative here. He says, whatever we see is changing, losing its balance. The reason everything looks beautiful, and I will repeat, the reason everything looks beautiful is because it is out of balance. but its background is always in perfect balance. This is how everything exists in the realm of Buddha nature. So when we think about our earth, our lives on this earth, we might recognize this for all our best intentions and ideas. Everything is constantly falling apart and together and apart and together. And in this way, we are always new and we are never lost. This is how everything exists in the realm of reality. So I'd like to tell you a little story. Um, this is maybe known to some of you, but it's a story of uh, Shakyamuni Buddha. Before he got the title of Buddha, he was known as Siddhartha. And Siddhartha, had gone to sit at a certain point in his um, in inquiry into the nature of reality. He went to sit under a tree, the Bodhi tree, and he sat and sat and inquired, what is this? Deep personal inquiry. And as many of you may have experienced yourselves, where there is inquiry, there is often doubt and confusion. So in this story, at, as Siddhartha was sitting in meditation, Mara, who is this figure of, um, a demonic figure who is the, known as the destroyer or the infiltrator or the troublemaker, um, gets, in Siddhartha's space and says, you know, I don't think you're really up for this. I don't think you're really qualified. For me, Mara speaking, no. Um, I have a whole platoon of soldiers who will bear witness to my greatness, to my awakening. Not for a mere mortal like you, Siddhartha. So this is what he, what Siddhartha does is he keeps a steady mind 
is not distracted by Mara, grounded as you were grounded a few moments ago in meditation. And he reaches down, touches the earth in front of him, much like you are touching the earth right now. And according to the story, the earth shouts out in a very loud voice, I, meaning the earth, I will bear witness to Siddhartha's awakening. And at that Mara is, the demon Mara is completely obliterated and, and goes off if he had a tail with his tail between his legs. And um, a short while later, Siddhartha sees the North Star, his mind awakens. And the story continues to this day in this room with you. So this, this, this story, there's a lot of imagery here and metaphor as in any story. And I'd like to just talk about that for a moment. This mudra of touching the earth has one part, the one hand on the ground, the other hand is resting open to the sky. So in a way, in this very physical representation, there is an expression of two truths, touching the earth, grounded in the moment, just now. What do you see? What do you hear? What do you touch? What do you sense? This is grounded in the relative momentary truth of your direct experience. This other hand that's open, we could say is representing this other truth that always exists alongside the relative truth. And that is absolute, known as absolute truth, which is that same point that was described when talking about ether, this before thinking mind broad, spacious awareness. There are many, many words for it, and none of them work. But they point a little bit to something that is inexpressible. And I think we all know about this in different ways. But it's the same foundational, absolute truth. So looking at these characters in this little story, Siddhartha, who is Siddhartha? There's a lot of colorful <clears throat> um, descriptions of his history, of where he came from and his experiences. But fundamentally, his experience is our experience. He is who we are. And each one of us, as we grew up, encountered old age, sickness, and death. All of us encountered big questions. What is this? Why am I here? What am I for? For a lot of people, that happens quite young. You know, middle school, 12 years old, and things aren't all that we thought they were supposed to be. <laughs> And the inquiry begins. So Siddhartha is us. And in this little story, this, uh, you know, this question arises for us as well. Is it possible for us to awaken? Maybe I'm not cut out for it. Maybe I don't have all the tools. Guess who that voice belongs to? 
Mara. So Mara is also us. And I wouldn't say that Mara is so much a demon, not a demon. It's just actually very human, very human quality that we will always have. I'm naturally a very shy person. Every time I get up to talk to people, I think maybe I'm really not so good at this. I better uh, just try. So every aspect of the story is just who we are. We know it very well. It's a kind of um, unintended self-sabotage. But I think that with this inquiry, we see it when it happens and we recognize it for what it is. And we can, through whatever practice we have, practice letting go of that. Being grounded, feeling secure and anchored. Over and over again, as a teacher, I find myself saying to my students, one by one, each one of us has it. There's nothing lacking in anyone. And how lucky we are that in any given moment, we can take it up and try again. So then this there's another character in this drama, and that is the character of Earth. One way to look at the earth might be to see it as a metaphor for the totality. The totality of all that is. And in, in regards to what I was talking about, these two kinds of truth, the relative and the absolute, the earth, our cosmos is that. And again, to refer to Suzuki Roshi, everything is constantly changing with the foundation that never changes. Feel the ground beneath your feet. Even the thoughts that arise are also it. So the earth bearing witness to Siddhartha's awakening. It's very interesting. The earth is also us. We bear witness ourselves. One of the things about practicing meditation is, um, you know, like the two truths, there are two aspects to meditation. One is cultivating a spacious awareness, wide field, wide awareness. As a mother, I sometimes think of it as mother's mind. You know how your mother, you're, sometimes you suspect that your mother had eyes in the back of her head? It's just that availability. Broad, spacious awareness with this razor-sharp focus on attention. This is bearing witness. If we're dis distracted, we're over here, fixated on a plan, an idea, a feeling or whatever, and whatever happens has gone right by us. We didn't see it. We missed, we missed clues. Oh, we weren't there. So I think that the most critical thing for our earth, for us, in whatever way suits us, is to cultivate 
first of all, this availability of spacious awareness and focused attention. We may have an idea, and it may be an excellent idea, of how to help our planet. But understanding deep within you that, that everything is alive in its flow and flux of change. If we keep along with our idea, this spacious awareness, we might be right there at the right time to make a good healing, a good effort in a way that we never imagined. But with our attention and awareness there, it's possible. When these two truths and these two practices of meditation come together, we can face the suffering of the world. And it's only natural then that we feel the kinship and the compassion for all of it. As much as we might be inclined to say or feel, we're going to hell in a handbasket for sure. That's just an idea that another one of those thought processes, like Mara, like the quality in our own mind, that we don't have to hold on to or we don't have to follow. And let that go. We are the earth bearing witness. And with the vitality of fire, our investigation, we can affect change. I think I'll, I'll end this with a, another quote. And this is from uh, a 20th century rabbi from Syria, who uh, in a novel he wrote, I came across this quote and I thought it was extraordinary. He said, before the plague, the flower of healing has already bloomed. Before the plague, the flower of healing has already bloomed. So that with great trust in us, the earth, with great courage and determination, Let's use everything about our precious life to keep it alive. Oh, by the way, I, uh, I don't know if people online can see it, but I have a Buddha here. So this is, this is a, a Buddha that I think is also another way of giving a Dharma talk without words. And... Uh, you might notice in this Buddha, first of all, it's made of clay. It's made of earth. It's made by the Raku process, firing process, which involves me playing with fire, which I love to do. I'm a pyromaniac at heart. Uh, and there's a bit of gold in there uh, representing flash of lightning. And there's a, a golden stroke of wind flowing around the body of the Buddha. So this figure represents everything about the meditation that we did and how we live in the world and how it can be beautiful, I hope. Thank you for listening. <laughs>